The goal of the international communist conspiracy is world domination. They have thus far been highly successful in accomplishing the step-by-step -step objectives necessary for reaching that goal. And so it has been, with but minor variations in one country after another. Divide the people. Create the appearance of popular support. Neutralize the opposition. Precipitate mob violence. Create the semblance of a revolution. An accurate summary of Lenin's strategy for the conquest of the world is as follows. First, we will take Eastern Europe. Next, the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle the last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We will not have to attack. It will fall like overripe fruit into our hands. By October of 1950, all of Eastern Europe was securely locked behind the Iron Curtain. By the summer of 1954, the greater part of Asia had fallen to the Kremlin's strategy and tactics. And each year, more nations lose their sovereignty to Marxist intrigues or degenerate into Soviet satellites as communism hastens to complete the encirclement of the last bastion of capitalism. And what of the United States? How goes the battle in the land of the free and the home of the brave? In every country now part of the Red Slave Empire, the actual number of Communist Party members at the time of takeover has been less than 1% of the total population. As Lenin phrased it, Communism must be built with non-communist hands. By cleverly beguiling thousands of well-intentioned people into unwittingly supporting the revolutionary program, the dedicated 1% can trick the 99% into surrendering their birthright. This they do by hiding the true communist objectives behind appealing slogans and pretended humanitarian goals. As Stalin explained, the revolutionary accepts reform in order to use it as a cover for his illegal work. Yet in one country after another, there have been alert, informed individuals who saw the signs, recognized the patterns of conquest, and raised their voices to warn the people. Against just such a contingency, the communists developed the third phase of their blueprint for world domination. Neutralize the opposition. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. A Communist Party directive issued in 1943 reads, Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. And so the seeds of dissension were sown among both the black and the white races. And inexorably, the people of the United States were being divided according to plan. Divide the people. Get them fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy. Create the appearance of popular support through a favorable press and the use of terror, intimidation, and the creation of martyrs make the world believe the revolution is a popular one, particularly among those being liberated. Neutralize the opposition. Precipitate mob violence. Get the mobs into the streets. March and demonstrate. As the demonstrations grow in number and intensity, they will acquire political character through the desired collision and open combat with the forces of law and order. Since mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war, what of the fifth principle of the communist strategy? Create the semblance of revolution. Listen, see, they, we, uh, we, the Negro people, down here have gotten completely fed up. And you know what they're going to do tonight? They don't care. They're not, they not going to fight down here no more. You know where they're going? They're after the white people. 
Now they after the white people, they gonna congregate. They gonna caravan out in Inglewood, play Del Rey and everywhere else the white man supposed to stay. They gonna do the white man in tonight, and I'm gonna wait now. <laughs> Anarchy, the breakdown of law and order, a chaotic reign of terror, mob rule and rioting, the collapse of government authority. These phrases ring strange in the ears of Americans and for good reason. Through the years, America has stood as the world symbol for law and order. Our government is responsive to the will of the people. Our courts and legislatures provide the mechanics for a peaceful redress of grievances. And the policeman on the corner has traditionally been looked upon as a friend, not as the instrument of a tyrant. Anarchy? Well, that was something we read about in our newspapers that was always happening in other countries. Perhaps the people in other countries had just reasons to riot against their governments. After all, many of the nations of the world are dictatorships in one form or another. What business was it of ours, anyway? Newsworthy, perhaps but it could never happen here. Then, in the summer of 1964, widespread rioting and looting suddenly broke out in Harlem, in Rochester, in Newark, in Jersey City, in Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Chicago, all within a few days of each other. It was as though an unseen hand had given the signal. Then, on August 18, 1965, guns replaced nightsticks in the hands of law enforcement officers as the Watts area of Los Angeles literally burst into a cauldron of insurrection. Thousands of rioters roamed the streets both night and day, smashing and looting, and setting the torch to over 50 square miles of the city. Hidden snipers held police and firefighters at bay as fires raged unabated. At least 35 Americans died in the violence and gunfire. The sheer magnitude of this monstrous madness strained the abilities of the civil authorities and the California National Guard was sent to Watts with orders to quell the violence with brute force if necessary. The spectacle of American soldiers shooting it out with American civilians was even more shocking than the rioting itself. The nation was stunned and horrified. No smugness now. This time, it wasn't a foreign country. This time, it was Anarchy USA. The degree of communist influence in these riots has been subject of much discussion and controversy. For a solution to this controversy, Let's review the events of recent years, both at home and abroad, in light of the Communists' own plans for world conquest. The Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can only be attained by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. The most powerful enemy can be conquered only by exerting the utmost effort and by thoroughly carefully, attentively, and skillfully taking advantage of even the smallest rift, of every antagonism of interest among the various groups or types within the various countries. Divide the people.
split them into quarreling factions, fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy. This is the comrade's first rule for the conquest of any country. For well do they know from long experience that the nation so divided and weakened can be easily conquered from within. For Mao Zedong, finding the point upon which to divide the people of China and create a revolution was comparatively simple. The Chinese for centuries had been principally tillers of the soil, eking a meager livelihood from land they did not always own and for which they paid tribute to landlords who generally had large holdings. Strong backs and legs were requisite to survival for the great masses who provided the power for China's limited and primitive industry and agrarian economy. A new regime promised reforms, but the communists were not interested in reform. They were dedicated to revolution because of the dissension and sabotage created by the insurrectionists and the reticence of some of the landlords and merchants to change the established traditions, the reforms were slow in coming. And so the rich and well-to-do were inclined to stay rich and well-to-do, and the lot of the poor fared only slightly better. And a minority of the Chinese peasants accepted the idea so subtly planted and avidly nurtured by the communist leaders. The so-called enemy of the people had been identified. It was the landlord. He was the cause of the misery and injustice. And so the point of division for the Chinese people was established. In Cuba, a land accustomed to crisis in government and the decrees of dictators, Fulgencio Batista headed a regime that was the least tyrannical Cuba had known for several decades. Rising levels of education, culture, industry, and commerce were enabling the people to enjoy the highest standards of living in all Latin and South America. Corruption in government there was, but no more than was to be found in many cities in the United States. Fidel Castro, a young, well-trained communist revolutionary with much experience, seized upon the issue of corruption in government as he undertook the creation of his revolution. It was the government, said Castro. The government was responsible for the problems and oppression felt by the people. It was the dictator and his followers. It was the Batistianos. They were the enemy. In Cuba, as in all countries, there were the poor and the poorly educated who labored in the fields. Castro promised agrarian reform, which focused the discontent of the rural community upon the latifundista. They, too, were the enemy. And so the communists, experts at fomenting discontent, began to split the population into quarreling factions, setting Cuban against Cuban. Algeria is a creation of the French. Before the French came to the land now known as Algeria, it was nothing more than a conglomerate of warring tribes. Their constant fighting among themselves for the best pasture land each spring and the best barley land each autumn kept the native population of the area at about 1,500,000 for 14 centuries. Today, after little more than 100 years of French rule, the population of Algeria stands at about 9 million. Under French dominion, the Algerian nation grew and prospered. The two cultures of Islam and Christianity were working together to create a good life. In the early 1930s, the dissident voice of the communist was heard among the people. At first it whispered, the Algerian nation is not France cannot be France, and does not wish to be France. Independence is the natural right of all peoples. As the seeds of disunity began to germinate, the dissident voice was heard more loudly to proclaim, Islam is my religion, Arabic is my language, Algeria is my fatherland. 
And so, too, in Algeria, were the issues that were to divide the people clearly defined. It was to be Muslim against Christian, Arab against European, Algeria against France. The enemy was personified as the Cologne. With phase one, that of dividing the population completed. The revolutionists were ready to move into phase two of the communist blueprint for takeover. Create the appearance of popular support. In every country now part of the Red Slave Empire, the actual number of Communist Party members at the time of takeover has been less than 1% of the total population. As Lenin phrased it, Communism must be built with non-communist hands. by cleverly beguiling thousands of well-intentioned people into unwittingly supporting the revolutionary program, the dedicated 1% can trick the 90 and 9% into surrendering their birthright. This they do by hiding the true communist objectives behind appealing slogans and pretended humanitarian goals. As Stalin explained, the revolutionary accepts reform in order to use it as a cover for his illegal work. In China, the propaganda mills were active in championing Mao's agrarian reform. The propagandists portrayed in vivid detail the hardships and injustices of the Chinese peasant. The communists popularized the slogan, Land to the Tiller. Mao Zedong exclaimed, We are not striving for the social and political communism of Russia. Rather, we prefer to think of what we are doing as something Lincoln fought for in the Civil War, the liberation of slaves. In the United States, those books which praised Mao Zedong as non-communist and an agrarian reformer were advocated reading, and some even became book club selections. It was later revealed that many of the pro-communist books and articles were written and reviewed in this country by communists. The American people, unaware of the treachery, were conditioned to accept the enslavement of China's millions. Cubans rallied round the slogan, Patria o Muerte. But perhaps the most widely used slogan was the one later to be used in Haiti and Venezuela, and still later in English in the United States. Venceremos, we shall overcome. Early in the revolution, Fidel Castro sought to reassure the people of the true nature of the uprising. I have said very clearly that we are not communists. Our revolution is a humanistic one. The press of the world sang the praises of Fidel Castro. Many eulogized him as the savior of Cuba. In the United States, Castro was referred to as the Robin Hood of the Sierra Maestra, that he pursued the same policy of taking from the rich and giving to the poor. The nation's press was quick to report, this is not a communist revolution in any sense of the word, and there are no communists in position of control. The only power worth considering in Cuba is in the hands of Premier Castro, who is not only not communist, but decidedly anti-communist. And so the Cubans and the Americans and the rest of the world were reassured that there was no infidel in Fidel. In Algeria, more land was owned by Muslims than was owned by the Europeans. Yet the propagandists claimed that the poor Muslims were being oppressed by the wealthy European landowners. The call was for Muslim unity. It was oppression, colonial oppression the Muslims were to fight. It was to be a holy war in God's cause. The insurrectionists declared that Algerians were an oppressed people 
living under a tyrannical colonial government, and therefore their revolt was a war of liberation. Since all Algerians held full French citizenship, both Muslim and Christian majorities regarded the idea of liberation as ridiculous. Ahmed Ben Bella, leader of the revolutionists, and four companions were arrested by the French and confined as political prisoners. Ben Bella later escaped to Cairo, where he and others set about the task of convincing France, the world, and the Algerians that Algeria needed to be liberated. Then started a systematic reign of terror designed to intimidate the Muslims into going along with the liberation movement. This book was published by the French army in an attempt to alert the free peoples of the world as to the true methods employed by the communist-led insurrectionists. The atrocities shown here were perpetrated upon the Muslims by Ben Bella's rebels parading under the banner of the National Liberation Front, or FLN. Men, women, and even children came under this merciless scourge in the name of freedom. We would never have brought these documents to the notice of public opinion had the torturers not chosen to depict themselves as victims, had the criminals not been transmuted into accusers. And that is exactly the way it appeared to the world. The French army was accused of police brutality. The godless revolutionaries were depicted as liberators. The insurrection was described as a popular and spontaneous uprising of the people. So effective was the programming of this big lie that some of the world's leading citizens were led to give aid and comfort to the enemy that plans to conquer the world. I am today introducing a resolution which I believe outlines the best hopes for peace and settlement in Algeria. It urges in brief that the President and the Secretary of State be strongly encouraged to place the influence of the United States behind efforts either through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or through the good offices of the Prime Minister of Tunisia, Sultan of Morocco, to establish the basis for a settlement of an independent personality of Algeria, interdependent with France and the neighboring nations. I believe this to be of vital importance to us. This photo was taken October 15, 1962, in Washington, D.C., and carried the following caption. Premier Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria and President Kennedy stand as Ben Bella receives full military honors shortly after his arrival today for talks with the chief executive. Ben Bella is expected to thank Kennedy for having called for Algerian independence as far back as 1957. After receiving full military honors at the White House, Ben Bella visited fellow revolutionary Fidel Castro before returning to Algeria. In April of 1964, Americans read in their newspaper, far more important facts are that Premier Ben Bella, though very much a dictator, is not a communist. One month later, in May of 1964, Ben Bella was awarded the Lenin Peace Prize in Moscow. Two months later, in July 1964, Communist Ben Bella declared, We solemnly reply here that our socialism stems from Islam. We repeat before world opinion 
that we are not communists. After the communists have found some issue or point of difference upon which they can divide the people, get them fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy, the next step is to create the appearance of popular support for the communists' war of national liberation. They have been devastatingly successful thus far. Yet in one country after another, there have been alert, informed individuals who saw the signs, recognized the patterns of conquest, and raised their voices to warn the people. Against just such a contingency, the communists developed the third phase of their blueprint for world domination. Neutralize the opposition. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. A Communist Party directive issued in 1943 reads, Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. In China, the formula worked well. The word landlord became almost an invective. Those who worked for the government were looked upon as grafters. The government under Chiang Kai-shek was reviled as an enemy of the people, a fascist tool of the ruling class. Those who refused to support the agrarian reformers were subject to surprise visits from roving guerrilla bands. The pattern was the same in Cuba. Those who were less than enthusiastic about Castro's reform were effectively branded as Batista followers. The man who spoke up against the revolt was labeled as a counter-revolutionary. Algerians who saw through the fraud and endeavored to warn the nation or their neighbors were vilified as extremists, colonialists, racists, fascists. Torture, death, and the fear of torture and death were also most effective weapons against those who might resist the tyrannical takeover. The number of atrocities committed in the name of freedom upon the Muslim people averaged nearly 20 per day for every day of every month for seven years. The next step in the communist strategy is the most easily recognized, for it consists of the tactic of getting masses into motion and thus precipitating mob violence. Master psychologists that they are, the communists know that once the masses are in the streets, it's not too difficult to convert an orderly demonstration into a full-scale riot. They know, too, that when rioting occurs, police and military forces of the government must move to restore law and order, and thus they have the first visible signs of revolution. Riots, demonstrations, street battles, Detachments of a revolutionary army. Such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. The official constitution and program of the Communist Party stated in 1921, The Communist Party will educate and organize the working masses for mass strikes and mass demonstrations. It is through struggles that the working masses are prepared for the final conflict for power. As these strikes grow in number and intensity, they acquire political character through unavoidable collision and open combat with the capitalistic state. Mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war. In 1964, a communist document taken from the Viet Cong stated, Get the people out into the streets. Quarrels should be provoked. Youth groups are to be armed with knives and clubs, allegedly to protect themselves in a the manufactured tension. In China, as in all countries, the communist appeal was aimed primarily at students, 
young, idealistic intellectuals, most of whom came from wealthy families who could afford to send them to school. It was from this group that the young communist recruits came who later provided the leadership and backbone for the armed conflict to follow. In Cuba, leftist-oriented students were the vanguard of the organized street demonstrations. Once the masses were in motion, that tenuous line between demonstration and riot, between nonviolence and violence, was easily obliterated. As law enforcement officers sought to restore order, police brutality became the cry of the insurgents. Algeria was more of the same. Rallies, demonstrations, marches, and the inevitable flare of violence. The invariable charges of police brutality were hurled as efforts were made to maintain law and order. When marches and demonstrations turn into riots in any country slated for takeover, the communists are then ready to implement the final stage of their blueprint for conquest. It takes only a handful of armed opportunists, criminals and savages, to create the semblance of revolution. Only insurrection can guarantee the victory of the revolution. The purpose of insurrection must be not only the complete destruction or removal of all local authorities and the replacement by new, but also the expulsion of the landlords and the seizure of their lands. Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces had long been fighting the communist-inspired insurrectionists of Mao Zedong when the Japanese invaded the mainland of China. With the end of World War II and the defeat of the Japanese, the United States pressured Chiang into forming a coalition government with the communists. Through a coerced truce and enforced arms embargo, the U.S. disarmed more than 30 divisions of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist troops. On the other hand, the Chinese communists fell heir to all the arms left by the defeated Japanese. And with the help of added armaments from Russia, Mao was soon able to ride in triumph throughout China and give 400 million Chinese agrarian reform, communist style. When it was time for the shooting to begin in Cuba, Fidel Castro received millions of dollars in cash and vast amounts of arms and ammunition from the Soviet Union and communist groups throughout the Western Hemisphere. At the crucial time in Castro's bid for power, the United States State Department declared an arms embargo against Batista's government, refusing to deliver even the arms that had already been paid for and were awaiting shipment. Yet, on the other hand, Revolutionary sympathizers were delivering men, arms, and ammunition to Castro daily from the United States. In Algeria, Ben Bella's rebels were fighting their war of liberation with guns and ammunition sent to them through Tunisia and Morocco by the communist bloc countries. And just as the revolution was coming to a head, a slight change in the overall strategy was instituted. In 1958, France's President Charles de Gaulle came to Algeria declaring with outstretched arms, I have understood you. I declare that from this day forward, France considers that in the whole of Algeria there is only one category of inhabitants, that there are only Frenchmen in the full sense. De Gaulle called for the people to vote on the question of independence for Algeria and the majority voted to remain French citizens, an integral part of France. De Gaulle said, three and a half million men and women have cast their votes of confidence. This is a fact that commits France and Algeria to each other for all time. Two years later, in 1960, the same French president, Charles de Gaulle, was heard to ridicule the Frenchization of the Algerians, 
and to talk of an Algeria in Algeria. It didn't take the leaders of the Army of Liberation long to change the talk of an Algerian Algeria into slogans demanding a Muslim Algeria. Ultimately, the revolutionary Ben Bella returned to Algeria and in due course established a regime of which he said, we solemnly reply here that our socialism stems from Islam. We repeat before world opinion that we are not communists. And so it has been, with but minor variations in one country after another. Divide the people. Create the appearance of popular support. Neutralize the opposition. Precipitate mob violence. Create the semblance of a revolution. An accurate summary of Lenin's strategy for the conquest of the world is as follows. First, we will take Eastern Europe. Next, the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle the last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We will not have to attack. It will fall like overripe fruit into our hands. By October of 1950, all of Eastern Europe was securely locked behind the Iron Curtain. By the summer of 1954, the greater part of Asia had fallen to the Kremlin's strategy and tactics. And each year, more nations lose their sovereignty to Marxist intrigues or degenerate into Soviet satellites as communism hastens to complete the encirclement of the last bastion of capitalism. And what of the United States? How goes the battle in the land of the free and the home of the brave? The communist plan for the conquest of the United States was explained to the American comrades by Moscow's agent Joseph Pogani, this country by Stalin for the revolutionary movement. American Negro Problems was published in 1928 by Joseph Pogani using the alias John Pepper, and carried the official communist line for America. The Workers' Communist Party of America, in its fight against imperialism, must recognize clearly the tremendous revolutionary possibilities of the liberation movement of the Negro people. The Black Belt of the South, with its starving and pauperized Negro farmers and Negro agricultural working masses, with its Jim Crowism, its semi-feudal status and its political system still bearing the earmarks of the period of slavery constitutes virtually a colony within the body of the United States of America. The Workers' Communist Party of America puts forward correctly as its central slogan, abolition of the whole system of race discrimination, full racial, social, and political equality for the Negro people. But it is necessary to supplement the struggle for the full racial, social, and political equality of the Negroes with a struggle for their right of national self-determination. Self-determination means the right to establish their own state, to erect their own government if they choose to do so. The Negro communists should emphasize in their propaganda the establishment of a Negro Soviet Republic. In 1934, the communist writers James W. Ford and James S. Allen further defined the Soviet Negro Republic. The actual extent of this new republic would in all probability be approximately the present area in which the Negroes constitute the majority of the population. In other words, it would be approximately the present plantation area. It would be certain to include such cities as Richmond and Norfolk, Virginia. Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina. Atlanta, Augusta, Savannah and Macon, Georgia. Montgomery, Alabama. New Orleans and Shreveport, Louisiana. Little Rock, Arkansas and Memphis, Tennessee. These cities and the cities which lie within their spheres of influence became known in communist writings as the Black Belt of the South and were to constitute the nucleus of a future Soviet Republic.
at the National Convention of the American Communist Party, held in New York City in June of 1940, James Ford, the Communist Party candidate for the Vice Presidency of the United States, said... For the Negro in the South. My people, the Negro people of America, have in the Communist Party their best defender, the unfailing champion of, the, of their cause. I accept its nomination for Vice President of the United States. By this time, the communist champions of the Negro race had hidden the revolutionary ideas and slogans for a Soviet Negro Republic behind the humanitarian banners of jobs, security, civil rights, and peace. These humanistic issues were to provide the friction necessary to divide the American people and lay the groundwork for revolution. I am Leonard Patterson. When I was a young man, only 23 years old, I joined the Communist Party. I was a member of the National Executive Committee of the American Young Communist League. In 1930, I was the official communist candidate for election to New York State Assembly. I knew Gus Hall and other top-ranking American communists very well because I trained with them at the Lenin University in Moscow. I joined the party because I honestly thought the communists were trying to help American Negroes. I broke away from the party when it became clear to me what the commons were really up to was to use the Negro people in this country as cannon fodder in a violent and bloody revolution aimed at the establishment of the American Soviet dictatorship. It was that simple and it is still that simple today. Make no mistake about it. What is happening in the United States right now, under the banner of civil rights, is exactly what has happened in China, in Cuba, in Algeria, and in many other places around the world. I'm Julia Brown. For nine years, I was a member of the Communist Party, serving as an undercover agent for the FBI. During that time, I learned that the communist conspiracy had been planning and working for years to bring violent revolution to America. It was to be a communist revolution, but the great majority of the American people would not be allowed to realize that until it had already happened. If all goes according to the communist blueprint, Americans will believe that the chaos and violence has something to do with civil rights. Our enemies were quick to find our weakest point for their attack. They knew that racial differences could provide them with an excellent wedge to divide our people. Their strategy simply has been to keep hammering on that wedge, to drive it deeper into our social structure, to open all wounds that have long since healed, and deliberately to create new ones wherever they can. Now, he, he, acted, he acted like a good nigger for the white folks. But I tell you, I don't want to. I don't want to even be around no more good niggas. I'm with them, no good Negroes. That's what they call Rodriguez, a good Negro. I want to be with the bad niggas, cause I know what's happening with the bad niggas. That's where I want to be. I want to be with the niggas. I want to be with the bad niggas that don't want to ride on the back of the bus no more. And this is what Elder Davis will call you. And the bad niggas is not gonna work for eighteen or twenty dollars. No, I want to be for the bad niggas who go register and vote. All right. 
I want to be for the bad niggas going to swim on any God's beach where water is flowing. I want to be for the Lyndon Johnson is the biggest nigger lover in the United States. Amen. He may think that he can use his Justice Department with Bobby Kennedy at the head of it, and he may think that he can use J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and the Army to force us white people here in St. Augustine and other parts of the nation to mix up with niggers, but if he sends troops in here and puts a bayonet behind every one of us, we still will not mix up with a bunch of black savages. I'd like to say, in a, in a real sense, not fellow freedom fighters, but fellow slaves. For we all are slaves, not only in this society, not only in this community, but all over this nation and all over the world. What you're doing here is very significant and it's very important. Then you follow up your friends and acquaintances and ask them if they want to help put this fight over to save this country from the onslaught of integration. You know the system is they want to throw white children and colored children into the melting pot of integration, through out of which will come a conglomerated, bladder, mongrel class of people. Both races will be destroyed in such a movement. I, for one, under God, will die before I'll yield one inch to that kind of a movement. What about that? the seeds of dissension were sown among both the black and the white races. And inexorably, the people of the United States were being divided according to plan. Among the so-called downtrodden and oppressed, among the supposedly starving and pauperized Negroes, the enemy was referred to as Whitey. Mr. Charlie the man, and the ofe. Phase one was well on its way. Now it was time to implement phase two, create the appearance of popular support. Beguile the people of the United States and the world into believing the pious fraud that the civil rights uprising, led by a handful of agitators, was a popular movement of the whole Negro race in the United States. Now this doesn't mean that there isn't a legitimate need for the advancement of civil rights for many of our Negro citizens. Of course there is a need there. Otherwise, communist agitators posing as civil rights leaders could never hope to enlist massive support for their schemes. The aspirations of Negroes for full equality were not created by communists, but they are used by communists in such a way that idealistic Americans of all races can be tricked into implementing the blueprint for revolution. Having been on the inside of the Communist Party, it's easy for me to recognize this revolutionary agitation in disguise. But the average American finds it's hard to believe that something as worthy and noble sounding as a civil rights movement could possibly be a communist maneuver. 
communism must be built with non-communist hands. The revolutionary accepts reform in order to use it as a cover for his illegal work. By concealing the true communist objectives behind appealing slogans and pretended humanitarian goals, the conspirators are able to dupe hundreds of uninformed opportunists and misguided idealists into supplying the non-communist hands needed in the overthrow of this republic. Thoroughly deceived, some of the Negroes cry for liberation through the slogan, Freedom Now. The democratic slogan, one man, one vote, has gained wide acceptance. But perhaps the most popular slogan is Ben Seremos, the rallying cry of the deluded peasants of Cuba, Haiti, and Venezuela. Ben Seremos, we shall overcome, is now the rallying cry of the deluded peoples of the United States. communist tactics and strategy in Moscow. My instructors emphasized the importance of using honest grievances and popular slogans as a smokescreen to cover up the true nature of the revolution. We were taught how to use propaganda and arouse the emotion of the masses. We learned how to set one group against the other and to make them hate each other. We learned the necessity of having martyrs and we were even told how to create our own martyrs if they did not imagine the result from the atmosphere of hatred. We were taught the importance of getting large masses of people into the street for marches and demonstrations. And finally, we were instructed in ways to pick off riots and make them spread and to keep them going. When I returned to the United States, I was immediately given practical training. I participated in so-called nonviolent demonstrations that were deliberately calculated to irritate white people and to violence against us. I personally was in charge of organizing a march on Washington to dramatize the Scottsboro Boys case. In New York about 1935, a Negro boy was reported killed by the owner of a store while in the act of stealing some merchandise. Communist Party headquarters decided to make a march out of the boy. So we went right to work, putting out handbills and holding open air meetings. In less than a half hour after we started, there was a race ride at 125th Street, complete with smashing wonders of white storekeepers, looting and all the rest. I'm not speaking of things I read about. These are things I personally participated in. <laughs> As it was in Cuba, so it was in Algeria. And so it is in the United States. In Jackson, Mississippi, Medgar Evers, state field secretary for the NAACP, was shot in the back by an unknown assassin as he was entering his home. After lying in state in Mississippi, the body of World War II infantry GI Medgar Evers was sent to Washington, D.C. 
for burial in Arlington National Cemetery. Now a victim of the very communist agitation he had helped promote, Medgar Evers was able to further serve communist purposes by being glorified as a martyr in the supposed fight of the Negro people for freedom and justice. Medgar Evers' remains were buried with full military honors and nationwide news coverage. As it was in Cuba, So it was in Algeria. And so it is in the United States. Mysterious bombings by assailants unknown plague the lives and property of the Negro people and serve to intimidate those who might speak out against the conspirators. The bombing of this Birmingham, Alabama church claimed the lives of four little girls attending Sunday school. A memorial service was held in Washington, D.C. for the four young victims, after which the mourners demonstrated their grief before the White House and the press. A martyr that rallied the sympathies of the nation was the lovely Viola Greg Liuzzo, who was shot to death while driving between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama, with a Negro civil rights worker. The American press told their shocked readers of her five children and husband, and her righteous zeal for justice that caused her to go to Alabama to help the American Negro gain the right to vote. This photo of Mrs. Liuzzo, taken during the Selma to Montgomery march and just prior to her death, points up the fact that the press failed to mention that the photo used to gain the sympathies of the nation was a high school photo taken almost 20 years earlier. That her five children were by three husbands. And that her name had been removed from Michigan's eligible voter list in accordance with state law because she had not used her voting privilege for six years. We were taught how to use propaganda how to arouse the emotion of the masses. We learn how to set one group against the other and to make them hate each other. We learn the sense of having martyrs and we're even told how to create our own martyrs if they didn't automatically result from the atmosphere of hatred. Divide the people, then create the appearance of popular support. And if any of the alert, informed citizens call attention to the true revolutionary goals behind the humanitarian slogans, move into phase three and neutralize the opposition. One effective way to neutralize any opposition is to liquidate it. In the summer of 1965, a respected Negro farmer in Alabama dared to speak out critically against the civil rights revolutionaries. In this cabin in late August, 87-year-old Perry Smaw struggled with an assailant who said he had come to get Perry's tongue. The aged Negro's skull was crushed with a cast iron frying pan, the attacker striking with such force that the skillet was broken. Then the intruder pulled Perry's tongue from his mouth and with a butcher knife, cut it off all the way back to the old man's tonsils. Perry Smaw, the man who dared defy the conspirators, died six days later. In China, Cuba, and Algeria, terror was also a most effective weapon in intimidating and neutralizing the opposition. And there's another, even more widely used method of neutralizing and paralyzing opposition to communism's conquests. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, 
label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. By duping the American public into turning a deaf ear to the voices of warning because the topics were controversial or because the patriots themselves had been ridiculed as extremists, racists, fright peddlers, the conspirators were ready to move one step closer to their hidden goals by precipitating mob violence. Riots, demonstrations, street battles, detachments of a revolutionary army. Such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. The Communist Party will educate and organize the working masses for mass strikes and mass demonstrations. It is through struggles that the working masses are prepared for the final conflict for power. As these strikes grow in number and intensity, they acquire political character through unavoidable collision and open combat with the capitalistic state. Mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war. You've been studying history, studying civet, but right now you've got to put your history and your civets in the streets. You've got to make the Constitution real. You've got to make democracy real. Since 1960, since February the 1st, 1960, more than 50,000 of your fellow students have been arrested and jailed, beaten, faced police schools and water hoses. Before we see real freedom, before we be able to walk down these streets with a sense of dignity and with a sense of pride and walk in freedom, no doubt there will be more jailings, more beating, more water hoses, more dogs. The other thing is this, we are determined that this city will not celebrate its quadricentennial as a segregated city if that celebration takes place. We plan to use everything within our power and all of the nonviolent weapons at our disposal to dramatize this blatant injustice and to demand that the federal government not put a cent in this city unless it decides to face the realities of desegregation. Right time, when Martin Luther King said march, we're going to have our march and cheese. And you know they've kicked us around a long time, haven't they? Yeah. And so many of us have come, we've come up in life without any shoes at all. And if it becomes necessary for us to march without shoes, we'll march barefooted. Yeah. I don't like the way you're clapping tonight. Are you ready to march? Yeah. Are you ready to march? Man, we are not afraid of dogs. No. Are we children? No. So many of us, we were raised up with dogs. Yeah. And we have had to, we have had to live the life of dogs right here in the United States of America. I want you to raise your hand high tonight. Everybody that's ready to march, raise your hand high. Raise it high. Are you ready to march? Are you ready to march? If you're ready to march, I want you to raise both of your hands above your head. I want you, now I want you to stand up on your feet. Keep your hands high. Now bring them together and clap them together. Everybody wants me. Everybody wants me. Everybody. 
And so, many were tricked into helping create the appearance of popular support for a conspiracy that hid its true objectives behind appealing slogans and humanitarian goals. A detachment of the deceived staged sit-ins. A handful of the hoaxed made freedom rides. A portion picketed and protested, while still others boycotted buses. And then more of the deluded mobs marched and demonstrated. As it was in Cuba, where the leaders of the humanistic revolution marched with arms locked in camaraderie, so it is in the United States, where the leaders of the freedom movement march with arms locked in brotherhood. As it was in Cuba, where the comrades marched arm in arm to shouts of Ben Seremos, so it is in the United States where the brothers march to the strains of We Shall Overcome. We shall In 1965, Martin Luther King explained the purposes of the marches and demonstrations as follows. The goal of the demonstrations in Selma, as elsewhere, is to dramatize the existence of injustice and to bring about the presence of justice by methods of non-violence. Long years of experience indicate to us that Negroes can achieve this goal when four things occur. First, Nonviolent demonstrations go into the streets to exercise their constitutional rights. Second, racists resist by unleashing violence against them. Third, Americans of conscience in the name of decency demand federal intervention and legislation. Fourth, the administration under mass pressure initiates measures of immediate intervention and remedial legislation. What is the march with them? Yeah. I didn't hear from everybody. Are you ready to march? Yeah. As Martin Luther King said, demonstrators staged a huge march on Washington, D.C. to dramatize their demands. They staged demonstrations across the country. And as Martin Luther King said, violence was unleashed. Then accordingly, the federal government intervened and a vicious legislative step on the road to tyranny was enacted in the form of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Now we mean business. Are you ready to march with us? As Martin Luther King said, the demonstrators staged a huge march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama to dramatize their demands. They staged demonstrations across the country. And as Martin Luther King had said, violence was unleashed against them. Then accordingly, the federal government intervened and still another vicious legislative step toward tyranny was enacted in the form of the Voting Rights Bill of 1965. And these enemies too, poverty, disease, and ignorance, we shall overcome. I 
broke away from the party when it became clear to me what the communists were really up to was to use the Negro people of this country as cannon fodder and a violent and bloody revolution aimed at the establishment of an American Soviet dictatorship. Give me that old freedom It was to be a communist revolution, but the great majority of the American people would not be allowed to realize that until it had already happened. If all goes according to the communist blueprint, Americans will believe that the chaos and violence has something to do with civil rights. Make no mistake about it. What is happening in the United States right now under the banner of civil rights is exactly what has happened in China, in Cuba, in Algeria, and in many other places around the world. The goal of the international communist conspiracy is world domination. They have thus far been highly successful in accomplishing the step-by-step -step objectives necessary for reaching that goal. In the United States, the communist plans call for two revolutions at once. A revolution of a supposedly oppressed proletariat or working class against a capitalistic system that is supposed to breed wage slavery, unemployment, poverty, crises, and war. The second revolution is a revolt of the supposedly poor and oppressed Negroes of the Black Belt against the supposed lynching, segregation, social ostracism, and exploitation of the white man. Currently, what the communists call their Negro revolutionary movement, now masquerading behind the humanitarian banners of civil rights, is contributing tremendous momentum to the communist plans to take over the United States. Divide the people. Get them fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy. Create the appearance of popular support through a favorable press and the use of terror, intimidation, and the creation of martyrs. Make the world believe the revolution is a popular one particularly among those being liberated. Neutralize the opposition. When obstructionists to the cause become too irritating, label them as fascist, Nazi, anti-Semitic, extremist, racist, controversial. Precipitate mob violence. Get the mobs into the streets. March and demonstrate. As the demonstrations grow in number and intensity, they will acquire political character through the desired collision and open combat with the forces of law and order. Since mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war, what of the fifth principle of the communist strategy? Create the semblance of revolution. Had not this rotten, fascist, racist cop, lieutenant, that killed a young cowboy, boy, had he not killed the boy, the boy very well might have died in South Vietnam in the name of freedom. Yeah. Could have very well have died in South Vietnam in the name of freedom. In the name of freedom. I was also asked to tell you not to get your passion so high, not to get too worked up. However, I think many of us are going to have to choose where we're going to die at. Where we're going to die at. <laughs> we're going to have to decide whether we're going to die on the streets of the United States or in South Vietnam. I would choose the United States myself. I would choose the United States myself.
From Havana, Cuba, free territory of the Americas, Radio Free Dixie invites you to listen to the free voice of the South. Stay with us for music, news, and commentary by Robert F. Williams. Robert F. Williams, a fugitive wanted by the state of North Carolina and the Justice Department, broadcasts weekly revolutionary messages beamed into the United States from Cuba. We shall take the torch of freedom and justice into the streets of America, and we shall set the last great stronghold of Yankee imperialism ablaze with our battle cry of freedom. Freedom now or death. In the monthly newsletter published in Cuba and sent into the United States through Canada, the revolutionist Williams tells the Negroes of this nation, we must be willing to suffer jail. We must be willing to suffer death. We must be willing to kill for freedom. There are Gestapo policemen on every street corner. It's just like Mississippi. And I predict things are going to grow worse. In fact, I think policemen are going to be dead before this situation is over. During the summers of 1964 and 1965, the demonstrations became riots, finally culminating in the worst race riot in this nation's history in the Watts District of Los Angeles. Across the United States, Law enforcement officers were dead, and Negroes did die in the streets, and the situation was far from over. Seven days after the rioting broke out in Watts, a new newspaper started publication, The Voice of All the Oppressed and Exploited. Calling for the workers of the world to unite, this new voice of the people declared that... All the people of the U.S. who oppose U.S. imperialism wish to thank the Communist Party of China and the Chinese people for their pledge of support for the people of Los Angeles in their struggle against U.S. imperialism. In keeping with communist principles and expectations, the atmosphere of hatred generated in the Watts riot resulted in 32 martyrs for the cause of liberation. In their memory, we pledge to destroy U.S. imperialism. In 1928, and again in 1934, and still again in 1965, we hear... The Negro people constitute a nation in the black belt of the South. And lest there should be any misunderstanding, Nobel Peace Prize winner Martin Luther King followed the example of Lenin Peace Prize winner Fidel Castro and Lenin Peace Prize winner Ben Bella and protested that, I am sick and tired of people saying this movement has been infiltrated by communists and communist sympathizers. There are as many communists in this freedom movement as there are Eskimos in Florida. <laughs> Last hour, we have offered only a brief survey of the material that's available to support the charge that the civil rights movement, as we know it today, is simply part of a worldwide movement organized and directed by communists to enslave all mankind. hundreds of additional witnesses and thousands of additional facts to testify to the communist involvement in the American civil rights movement. But the limitations of time prevent their inclusion here. We urge you to continue your studies of these unpleasant truths, 
and gain a more complete understanding of the conspirators' plans to subjugate the United States. Begin by reading, It's Very Simple, The True Story of Civil Rights by Alan Stang, The Civil Rights Packet, and the other books and pamphlets on civil rights that are available from one of the American opinion libraries across the nation. We also urge you to resolve first that you will not fall victim to the communist plot to set race against race, American against American. And second, that you will now join with other patriots in a positive program and concerted action to save for our children and their children this once glorious country and humane civilization which we ourselves inherited. <laughs>